All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, we are here today with Olympia, Olympic legend Tony Azevedo. Uh, Tony, how you doing, man? I'm good. How's everyone doing in this uh, terrible situation we have going around the world? Look, you know, we're going. What's up, Nova Lee? Hey. Um, you know, I think something that I've been saying a lot, because you see a lot of people out there doing some online workouts and things to keep you guys in shape, which I think is important. Um, but I, I just want to bring up something that I brought up uh, with Jimmy before is the importance of, of our community, of water, the water polo community, I call it, right? Like when I look back, I don't miss a day of playing the sport. I miss all the guys. I miss the memories. I miss the camaraderie. Um, and, and that's still what I miss today. And, and for some of you who, who are missing out on, on a JOs, on a final season or whatever it may be, I mean, that doesn't mean that these memories can't still be happening, right? And, and you're going to go back years from now and you're going to look at this time and, and wonder if you did create memories. Because the biggest thing, the hardest thing for us is basketball players can still play basketball outside. Baseball players can still throw the ball. It's hard for us to play water polo, right? And, you know, if you don't have a pool, even if you do, like, what, there's no, you're going to put a goal in your pool. Um, so what I recommend is, like, be leaders and connect, connect with your kids and connect with your, your teammates and talk water polo. Watch a video and make, make fun of yourselves. Um, create a trivia. What, you know, I just did it this morning with, with a group where we just broke down a video and every offensive series I asked them, you know, why the defense was doing that. Just why, right? Because I don't think we understand a lot of times the, the question why. Why does coach make us do these boring fundamentals, <laughs> right? Why, why, is, why are they running an M zone? right? You just maybe coach tells you it's an M zone, but why? And I think that's so important. And now's the time. And I truly believe it. I mean, you have, you have so many people doing video breakdown and, and talking and conferences like we, we had with the six, eight. I think this generation, you guys can be the smartest, the, you know, bring us back because I'd say our weakness is our, 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 our game awareness and our game sense, especially a lot of you that come from outside of some of the meccas of water polo, right? So this is a time where everyone's in the same boat. Take advantage of that. Get that edge. You know, watch video and don't just watch it for 15 minutes and say, I did it. Sometimes watch a player, someone you want to be like. And sometimes just write down every, you know, every scenario or, you know, a couple scenarios. Why did they do that? Why did he shoot? What defense did they play? And maybe send it to your coach and say, hey, this is my answer. What do you think? What do you think about it? Was I right or was I wrong? And even if you're wrong, it doesn't matter. You're just putting yourself in those situations. And that's making you think water polo more. And that's making you better. Right? I always, I always, uh, you know, I, 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 when I was, when I was, when I was growing up, my dad always, always would tell me where I needed to look. Right. So upon a six on five, I received the ball from one. What am I looking at? And for me at a young age, I was always taught to look at the defender immediately in front of me first, the goalkeeper second. And then the moment I had the ball, I needed to look at the middleman. So I trained myself years, you know, over the years that whenever on six on five, no matter what position I was, I caught, I looked at the middleman. That was the first person because that dictated my next pass, my next move. Right. But since I'd look at the goalie and my own def defender first, I knew I was either going to catch and shoot or catch, look at the defender and make a decision. Right. These are things that I don't think we're teaching anymore. Um, but these are things that you can you guys can start to to put yourselves in those situations and say, why, why you know, why that middleman was there. If you look at ah, that was open. Right. The three posts or the three posts was there. That guy came back. The five guy was open. So. Hopefully the numbering are, are the same all over, but I mean, that's just, that's just how I feel. I think working out alone is terrible. I've had to do it for two years and now I just do camps to stay in shape, <laughs> but uh, 
you know, get together with your, with your groups and, and maybe every day you switch off, who's going to lead the workout, right? What workout are we going to do? Um, and, and again, talk trivia, talk the game as a team. That's a great way to get, get a sense of what everyone's doing. Right. Um, yeah. So look, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, right? I was telling Jimmy, we had a, a phone call today about creating the first women's water pole professional league here in the U S. Um, and we're really optimistic that it'll probably launch in 2022, which is amazing news for us. Men will come along after. Um, but like, I, you know, I just, I, I always think that there's something positive and, and our sport is number one. And I really think that you can take something out of everything. And right now there's, there's something you can take and that's become a student of the game. And that's to learn how to keep in shape, keep healthy at home which means your nutrition, your diet, and, and doing some kind of working out every day. So any questions? Yeah, Tony, um, a couple of questions that came in during registration. And then uh, once I get through these couple, uh, anyone is welcome to raise their hand and we'll, we'll pick you out. But um, Sydney from Nutri Aquatics is curious to know, who is your inspiration? My inspiration was Manuel Estiardi. He's the only six time Olympian in the world. And, you know, I loved water polo. I liked baseball a little more, but in 96, I got to be the ball boy. And when I, when I watched him, he was five, seven, I think five, eight, like tiny, not strong at all, but he was considered the greatest player to ever play this game. He was so quick. He was so smart. He was so fast. And I always knew I liked water polo and that I was going to be good at it and that I wanted to, you know, go a little further. But in the back of my head, I always kind of thought maybe baseball would be the better route because I was not as tall as all the Olympians and I'll never be as tall. My dad is short. He's short over there and fat. So it's like, I was like, no, I'm not, there's no way I, I'm going to be able to, to get there. And, uh, and then, when, when they won that gold medal and they were all crying and, and everyone was jumping in on him, I sat there and I had goosebumps and I was just still like this. And he came, comes over to me and he, get, and, he, and he taps me on the head and he goes, maybe, maybe you like me and walks away. And there's a reason why my hair is long because here his hair was long and, and it changed my life. I, I decided that I think the greatest thing, and I, Jimmy knows this, one of the greatest things a coach can give an athlete is uh, tell them what their weakness is and help them make it a strength. And it was that moment that I asked my dad, you know, what do I need to do to make the next Olympics? And he's like, you know, you're small, you're short. So you got to be the quickest player out there and the smartest. You're slow. you got to be the fastest. And that was it. For three years, I swam. I lifted to be the fittest player out there. And that would help with my quickness and intensity. And in three years, that was the path that he built with me with a, with a family friend for me to make my first Olympics at 18. Excellent. Yeah, he, he was so explosive and such a fun player to watch. Uh, so I totally get where he was one of your inspirations growing up as an athlete. Um, Paul Split from Moose Water Polo. I was curious to know, this is kind of a two-part question. What in-game analytics do you value the most? And in preparing for a team, how do your analytics drive the preparation process? Well, um, as far as the in-game analytics that I value most, it's earned ejections. I, I mean, you got to you gotta understand, like, um, you know, obviously assists, people who, who can create assists are, are right up there with, with it. But I think the most undervalued analytic is earned ejections. Right. Like there's one of the things to strengths that helped me later on was, yeah, maybe I didn't score. I always had a couple assists, but man, I earned four to five ejections a game. And if you can earn four to five ejections, that means you're driving people crazy because you're moving, you're moving, you're moving, you're not stopping, but also you're creating five amazing. And if you have a good six on five, a 70 percentile opportunity for your team to score now. Right. So as far as how it, how it translates in the, into your game, you know, for me, it's, it's what's your vision. And I think I've been big on that, right? Like we don't do that enough in our sport. Every team should have a vision. 
right? An identity. And I, I said, you know, if you were on the 6A conference, it was about, you know, the, the identity of the Alabama with Bear Bryant was run that football. The identity with the Golden State Warriors is ball movement. Well, what's your identity? What's your team's identity? Maggie's team identity is now movement, but the prior Olympics was five on six. 2008, our identity was defense with a focus on five on six, and it allowed us to own it. We knew we got ejected. This is our thing, guys. It just raised the bar on the energy level for us because we knew that was it. That's what we were about. Um, and I believe it changes with all teams. On that team, that, that had to have been our identity. In 2000, we had one of the greatest centers ever to play in Chris Humbert. Our identity was getting him the ball, right? It was patience, spreading out, getting that ball to set, and then finishing on six on five. But, you know, I don't think we really even spoke about having an identity. Um, but so going back to what you said, assists and earn ejections, if those are my two analytical uh, faves, then how's that going to affect my game? Well, that means my game is going to be a lot of movement, a lot of movement. And in my trainings, I'm going to have tons of passing, passing, so that these players, when we do earn a lot of ejections, we are not dropping the ball, putting the ball in the water on six on five. We're making crisp passes and catching and shooting because six on five, if I have earned ejections, becomes our identity. Wonderful. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Sophie Raquel, West Sub, Water Polo. Uh, curious to know, how do you work through hardships happening in your life while being focused on water polo? Yeah, um, I think, I think I, the most important thing to think about is water polo was my outlet in situations where I was depressed or hardships were happening or school was overwhelming or my grandmother, you know, got hit by, she was very close to us, got just annihilated by a bus in, in Brazil you know, when we were in high school and it was devastating to, to everyone. And, and I think the outlet I had was water polo. That became, that's why it's even so important to me because it became my way of separating. I, I knew in the water that was, that was a different me. Even, even now, like nervousness, anxiety, whatever it is, when before you're doing new things or like the call I had this morning with the company for the league, you know, just when I get in the water, it's, that's my element. So I think, you, I think what you can do is just really try and make water polo that outlet. Like, love it. Know that this time I am focused on polo. I'm going to enjoy my time in here. I'm not taking it for granted. I'm going to work so hard. And then I can go and try and, try and deal with reality when this is all over. Um, but for me, I, I really, a water polo became like, and, and you talk to a lot of people, a lot of kids have bad anxiety and water polo has been one of the things to help them through that. So that's the best I have. I mean, I know I had an issue where when I had big things at school, um, it really affect my practices. I wasn't there mentally. And my dad always said, I don't care if you bring your body, bring your mind. Um, and uh, I just, I just started understanding that. And like, Two minutes before I, or five minutes before I got in the water, I just visualized, take some breaths and be like, I'm going to have the best practice out there. Um, and it would let me focus on that. And the moment it's over, boom, my brain goes back to, oh my God, I got that midterm. Oh, oh. Thank God I don't have midterms anymore. Thanks, Tony. Um, with 6 8 Sports, uh, a lot of your focus right now is on just the fundamentals of the game. Um, if you had to pinpoint, three fundamentals that are the most important for a high school athlete to progress through to get to the next level. What do you think those three fundamentals would be? Well, if, 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 if I could choose three, it would be passing correctly. If you have a proper passing, I mean, that means you catch the ball, you're here, you have no hitches. You don't hold the ball here. You have no hitches. Your, your elbow's not down. You're not straight up using only your arm. If you passing to me, I mean, I'd argue that I could take any team and we would just pass 
and that we could be the best team in the world. Um, the second would be the most boring of all, which is over the hip, right? Which is your feet are in front of you. You go over your hip, you hit, and then you recover. That was probably my most hated drill, but because it was, I had to do it so often at every level, it never stopped. I mean, I, I can remember my fifth Olympics, we'd have go into stations and we'd be doing that drill over and over and we'd have to visualize all right i'm x5 so i'm hitting the lefty and then i'm returning to the post um but that is that's all you do in a game and you see like when i was in playing professionally in europe these guys do that they don't swim anywhere they just swim that little bit between the counterattack. the rest of it is over their hip here when i'm driving they're all they're just moving over their hips because they're so comfortable and then the last one would be the spider exercise which we all know especially with the new rules, you can't let people get inside water. It's a penalty. So spider, you know, for me is something, again, that you're sitting here, you're comfortable with turning here, turning here, boxing them out, you know, use the idea of basketball, how you're not going to let someone get into the lane. And that's why that, you know, get, have someone get in the lane. You have to box them out, stay between the man and the ball the entire time. And the three drills for you can do that are spider, right? And going over your hips so that when you do, the guy does lunge back, you can lunge with him. And then again, for, for me, passing. If you can pass correctly, you can shoot. If you can shoot, you can score. If you can score, you can win. So passing, 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 and those legs. Like my practices would be predominantly those. I heard you say the other day that if you had a team that just worked on fundamentals and passing, you'd win all your games. <laughs> well, it, I mean, obviously, the, it, look, I use it as an extreme. I, I think you have to have that swim base. Swimming so important. Um, but I think a lot of swimming can be done within, within a practice. Uh, like I said, Dante Dedamonte, we, we didn't swim one. Not, in my for two years at Stanford with Dante, I had zero swim sets. We'd get in, warm up. And we, we do counterattack drills the entire time, right? Scrimmaging is something I've always been against. Why? I mean, it'd be like a teacher saying, all right, do whatever you guys want. Scrimmaging, you want to get play? It should be controlled scrimmaging. It should be five attempts on offense running a press, then counter out of it. Five attempts on offense running a zone, then counter out of it. Ten attempts on six on five, then counter out of it. Like everything you are dictating what the players are doing. So. If, but, but I 100% agree. I mean, you go to some of these European practices and I lived all over and swimming is just like at the beginning, right? And then it's some, some of these sprints, they just pass. I mean, we pass for 20, 25 minutes and then it would be leg work, leg work, leg work. And then we'd shoot. And then at the end, okay, we'll work on some six on five or a little front court or not. So if, if I could take a team and we'd pass for an hour. That's it. The only thing we do on our team is pass. Well, there's enough awesome passing drills that my team would, would be in amazing shape because passing is hard. I can't even pass anymore for 10 minutes without touching the bottom. And your legs would be that much better. You'd be that higher out of the water. It'd make you a better shooter if you're a great passer. You'd never drop the ball. You wouldn't give turnovers because you're so comfortable with the ball. 100% passing to me is everything and obviously the fundamentals fundamentals love it uh ruby meyer from west suburban water polo uh, is curious to know what is the mindset you go into or have prior to a game so for me it was it was it started difficult because it, you know you you're young and you're just having a fun time and then naturally i started scoring i was a pretty good shooter and that was kind of like, all right, I'm going to get in the game. We're going to play. I'm going to score a couple. Um, and then all of a sudden, I started playing at the higher levels, right? And I didn't score. And it was devastating. I lost my confidence. Um, I was so worried about what other people felt about me. And if I played well or not, or if I scored or not, that if I didn't score at the beginning of a game, I wouldn't shoot again. And you pretty much, I was out of my element. So the great Monty Niskowski, you know, he's the one that pulled me aside and 
made me understand all the other things that I do for the team. And when I thought about it like that, I realized you're right. Dude, I, even as a 17 year old on my first team, I earned, I averaged three to four ejections a game. I was, I, I, I had two assists and every assist was me because I was a great set passer with a set pass to Humbert that in set. And I started realizing I'm countering hard. I drive nonstop that I did so much more for the team. So my mindset going into every game from that point on and still until the day I retired was I was going to focus on what I could control. I could go as I could do everything harder than everyone. I left everything in there in the pool and I wanted every single person that guarded me in that game to remember me. And I wanted them to think about the, the I wanted them to remember me and think that was the hardest player I ever played against. And the next time they guarded me, I wanted them to have nightmares. And that was the reality of it. Right. I think that there's, the only thing worse than losing to me is not being remembered. If you're not, if, if you finish a game and no one remembers, remembers you in that game, then you probably didn't do anything. So that was it. I wanted to be remembered every game and it was a defense focus. I, I wanted to win, but I didn't care about winning. I cared about doing everything I possibly could for my teammates and to be remembered. Awesome. Um, Tony, uh, coach Miguel has a question for you. Miguel. Yeah, Tony, um, you mentioned on the Near Side Low podcast you did uh, last month that one of your favorite memories was the uh, game in Chicago in our zone against Serbia a few years back in uh, 2016, I believe. And uh, we did a breakdown of that game. And specifically, I had my players, uh, we were watching the Serbians, watching the, uh, went out you know, to watch uh, Perlanovic and uh, the lefties. Being a one-two side player, you were matched up a lot against Mondic and Filipovic that game. It seemed like you were you kind of took Filipovic out of that game. Mondic kind of stepped up, but uh, when you were on Filipovic, what, you mentioned like you want players to, uh, you know, remember who you were. What were some of the top players that you played against? Uh, some of the top lefties on the that, that side of the pool that you can remember guarding that you went in knowing, okay, I got to have a game plan for this guy. Yeah, well, um, you know, it's funny you talked about Mondic. This is how old I am. My team in 2000, uh, 2009 in Montenegro, uh, the, the sponsor, or 2010, the sponsor left, so we had no money. Um, and everyone basically striked, except for me, because my contract was different. Uh, so I played with a bunch of young guys. And this young 14 and under, named, we nicknamed him Panda, because he was like a little short, fat left-hander. Uh, his job, and I would look at him every day, I'd say, you, get after the foul, just throw me the ball, I will be open. I would, get, I would tell him every day. Well, that kid turned out to be Dusan Mandic, who is one of the <laughs> best left-handers in the world, <laughs> um, who, going forward, I couldn't guard, which is crazy. Like, I, I had, you know, I was, I, I pride myself as a great defender. And like a Filipovic, I never had a problem with. I knew how he was going to shoot. He, I stayed high in the lane because I knew he wouldn't drive, and he just hated me. Um, Jokovic, another great left-hander, same. I had him. I had him. One of the hardest left-handers uh, that I ever guarded was Tibor Benedict from Hungary. He, he, he was actually another one of my inspirations because why he made, was so hard, he never stopped. He never stopped moving. He was talking and moving and posting up and countering and getting into me, and he wasn't a dirty player. And I just remember, I want to be like that guy. Like, he worked so hard, and the people followed, and he was such a leader. Um, and then do, and Bondage, I, I, it's crazy. You know, we still, jo you know, I still joke around. I still call him Panda in the last Olympics when I go in against him. I'm like, all right, Panda, here we go. But if I had him, I had to switch out. He, he's so strong, and he gets up so high that as high as I, go I could get, I couldn't block it. So no my, and I, if I had him on me, I immediately called Luca Cupido, who had, you know, who's taller and had good enough legs to, to guard Mondic. But that guy was so explosive and powerful. I would say my last Olympics, that was one of the humbling things going, all right, I think I'm ready to get out of here. <laughs> so. Awesome. Last question, uh, Jimmy, or are we done? Yeah, last, last question. Uh, Coach Paul was curious uh, to know. Coach? 
Hey, Tony, I was curious, uh, who's the best teammate that you ever had? And then what made him the best teammate that you ever had? Adam Wright, hands down. Played for a lot of teams, had a lot of great teammates. There was no one even close to Adam Wright. He, what made him great, his, 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 uh, his games awareness. The guy was one of the smartest guys ever. He knew exactly where to be, where to put the ball. If our set was open, Adam made a perfect pass. If I was open, he made me a perfect pass. Um, this is a short, not never been a ripped uh, athlete who had to guard all the best players on the one-two side. And he would, he would not only guard them, but he'd get them ejected because he was so intense. And I can remember Adam and myself going at it. He would guard me every day. And at the beginning, right, even though I was a lot younger than him, I really didn't have a problem against Adam. But he just kept coming and coming and coming. And he learned my shot that no one in the world learned, my little one thing. And Adam learned it. And it drove me crazy that he'd block me in practice. So then I had to learn another shot. Then he'd learn that one. And we'd go at it and we'd kill each other. I remember wanting to kill Adam Wright. And then the moment the game ended, we were best friends. And we'd talk about, that was a great practice. Hey, look, we both have to go and motivate uh, Bailey because he, was, he doesn't like swimming. The <laughs> so we had to help Bailey get a little more motivated. And, and what, not only is Adam just in general a really funny guy, which was good for the team, but he really cared. Right. And, and he said whatever he felt to anyone. Right. And he he took the time and he knew that I had con better connections with some of the players. And we talk about how I would go and approach them. He had a lot of closer connection to some. And we talked about how he would approach them. But you could see his passion and how much he cared for the team um, that he 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 raised the bar for all of us in every practice. And it really helps because. Coming from me, your leading scorer, your captain, always saying, come on, guys, let's go, let's go. Like, work harder. A lot of times I had to just be quiet because that, it sounds like I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm just this elite guy saying, oh, come on, you, you peons work hard. While when it's coming from Adam, right, when it's coming from the guy who at first was the 13th player pick, chosen to the team, you know everyone's going to listen, Right. And it just really isn't, was inspiring. And he ended up being such a huge role on this team. And I'll finish with, you know, Adam, Adam, was, Adam was, will, was willing to do whatever it took for the team. And if whatever it was, my one nemesis was this goalie, Shagir, from Germany. This little German goalkeeper. Little. But it was, he's, he's been to like five or six Olympics. The smartest guy. And this guy had my number since I was an 18 year old, whatever I shot, he blocked. Right. And I, I promise you, I went through tons of like mental training to just get over it. Luckily we didn't, Germany wasn't a big rivalry. So it didn't matter. The only goalie in the world that got in my head was this guy. We are at the Olympic games. We need to beat Germany. Um, in order to go automatically to the, to the top four for the medal round. And we get a penalty with like four or five minutes to go. And I just freak out, right? Like I hadn't scored against Germany forever. I'd score one or two, but it'd be like a quick shot. You know, most of the time he was on me. And I just, I, I remember the last four penalties I missed against him. So obviously everyone, Tony's going to be the one to swim. And I just start swimming up there, just scared, you know, and, and I shouldn't be telling you this because I should be never scared, but I was. And I just remember Adam called for the ball, and he's like, I got it, Tony. I got it. Adam, who never shoots penalties, and if there was a shootout, he'd be the last one to shoot. He just grabbed the ball and goes, I got it. He scored. We ended up winning that game by one. And uh, those are just the little things and how smart he was. And he knew when we needed his help, and he was always there for us. So, all right, everyone. Incredible. Peace. Stay Tony, thanks so much for your time. Stay smart. Take care. See ya. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Bye. Everyone, thanks for tuning in. Have a great rest of your day and weekend. Bye for now. Thanks.